Tēnā koutou katoa and greetings to you all from New Zealand. Special thanks to Air Marshal Hupfeld and the RAAF for pressing ahead with this conference to keep us all connected. And a great opportunity to adapt how we network in a challenging environment. In this presentation, I'm going to outline the New Zealand Defence Forces perspective of near region security operations. I'm mindful at the outset that there's often a temptation to rewrite everything around the crisis of the moment. And of course, COVID-19 does have us all focused. And although it's early days, it does look like our world will be different as a result. But there are many other important layers to our security environment. COVID-19 won't displace those layers, but perhaps it will complicate some of them. So let's look at those layers in New Zealand's near region, our corner of the Indo-Pacific. When we rotate the globe and view New Zealand at its centre, we see a picture of a rather modest fortress surrounded by a very large moat. We've recently pulled up the drawbridge and that's a very handy thing to be able to do. Thousands of kilometres of open ocean, about 11% of the Earth's surface, can provide a useful security barrier. But of course, the modern context demands a more sophisticated approach than that. In our near region, which is the South Pacific, New Zealand's security is closely linked to that of our immediate neighbourhood. This is a region that consists of vast maritime distances, of many very small nation states and of a vast icy continent. In addition, the cyber and space domains have forced us to rethink the overall relevance of pure geography when it comes to our security. New Zealand's neighbourhood features some traditional defence and security challenges amidst an overall context of increasing geostrategic competition. But there are some other emerging security challenges that demand our attention and which make this picture more complex. They're not necessarily military in nature, but they have a real impact on security. They require us to take a broader response. What emerges is a different kind of grey zone, if I can borrow that term, that challenges us to adapt. But first, let me set the context a little more. New Zealand's security is very much linked to global security and a functioning rules-based international system. And so we maintain and deploy defence capabilities that contribute to that global security environment. That's why you'll find us in the Middle East, in Africa, and in many corners of the Indo-Pacific supporting security operations. But in our near region, New Zealand is a Pacific nation through geography, culture, and identity. We are in and of the South Pacific, and our security is intrinsically bound to the peace and security of the region in all its diversity. As a small nation and a big neighbourhood, we have to be flexible in our approach to security and in how we use our capabilities. So while the NZDF maintains core warfighting capabilities normally expected of a small military, we also conduct roles that are more akin to a Coast Guard, search and rescue, prevention of illegal immigration, transnational crime, monitoring foreign fishing vessels and HADR, all fall within our remit. Our search and rescue region alone stretches from the South Pole to the equator. The NZDF operates throughout this area to undertake a broad array of tasks, both military and non-military in nature. So when we look at security challenges in our near region, it's through a fairly broad lens. We can see that Pacific nations are confronting intensifying challenges from the impacts of climate change, transnational crime and resource competition, with a growing gap in capacity to address them. This combination of complex issues will test governance and resilience and likely require increased assistance. The pandemic, of course, adds another layer again. Only just a few weeks ago, we had the challenge of supporting Pacific nations in the wake of Cyclone Herald, while being careful to ensure that we do not introduce COVID-19 into small nations that have a limited capacity to manage an outbreak. Ask Pacific Island nations themselves about their biggest security challenges, and climate change is often at the top of the list. 
The region is facing dramatic effects from sea level rises, more frequent and more intense cyclones, prolonged droughts, ocean acidification, soil salinity, and decreasing fish stocks. At the Pacific Island Leaders Forum in 2018, the Boy Declaration on Regional Security was signed. It reaffirms that climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of Pacific nations. And it recognises an expanded concept of security that includes human security, environment and resource security, transnational crime, and cyber security. As a defence force, we view all of these as very much interlinked with the other more traditional view of military security. If not well managed preemptively, these challenges will stretch regional militaries with a growing number of operations to manage disaster recovery and to bring stability. Further south, the climate is changing in Antarctica too. That vast and inhospitable continent is becoming more accessible, and so are the waters surrounding it. This in turn is attracting more interest from both state and non-state actors. So far, an international treaty system has served us well in the Deep South, but that may face challenges as congestion and interest grows. So this too will demand our attention and renewed cooperation between us all. So far, I've talked only about the physical air, sea and land dimensions of our geography. How do we bring the other two domains of space and cyber into a discussion of the near region? As it happens, the South Pacific has very definite challenges and opportunities when it comes to the space domain. Challenges because of the lack of good coverage across the region, but new opportunities to resolve the perennial problem of wide area domain awareness. And opportunities also to seize emerging new space initiatives, something that New Zealand is already pursuing. Obviously, with both space and cyber, security threats are far more pervasive. Our reliance on free and safe use of those domains increases every day, and New Zealand's geographical drawbridge is not much use in providing security. We're all close neighbours in the global commons of space and cyber. And that reminds us of the need for strong international partnerships and a rules-based international system. In 2018, New Zealand's government recognised the array of challenges in our region, including climate change, economic resilience and human development, as well as a more contested strategic environment. It responded by launching the Pacific Reset to lift the level of strategic attention that we needed to pay to the region. The Pacific Reset was followed by the Strategic Defence Policy Statement, which elevated the priority for our Defence Force to be able to respond in the Pacific to the same level of priority as New Zealand's own territory. This elevation represents a steadfast commitment by New Zealand to the broader security of our near region. And it shows how closely it's linked to our own national security. Last year, we released a defence assessment titled Advancing Pacific Partnerships, which offers a vision for an intergenerational investment in a secure, stable and resilient South Pacific, achieved through partnerships and regional security architectures. For New Zealand, People-to-people -people ties have long been the cornerstone of our approach in the Pacific. We focus on listening to Pacific partners, understanding their priorities, and working alongside with respect and on an equal footing. The NZDF's aim is to be a reliable long-term partner, and advancing Pacific partnerships reinvigorates that long-standing commitment. For the NZDF, all of this means lifting our capacity to deliver operations and support in the South Pacific. And the detail of that was published in last year's Defence Capability Plan. The Capability Plan prioritises investments that provide the NZDF not just with military capability for military contingencies, but also regular utility within our near region for the large number of non-military tasks we have as a partner. So, as you'd expect, sea lift, air lift, 
amphibious capabilities, surveillance, and wide area domain awareness all rate a mention. We're also prioritizing cooperation with other like-minded partners who can make significant contributions to Pacific security within long-term regional frameworks. Australia, France, and the US are all frequent partners in these frameworks, but of course there's others. But at the heart of it, respectful face-to-face -face interaction is fundamental to how Pacific Island communities operate. And it's fundamental to reinforcing the people-to-people -people links. It's what must be the foundation of valued and trusted long-term partnerships that enhance our regional security. What we're growing is a neighbourhood watch system on a grand scale, and for that to work, you have to know your neighbour well. We need to be more present. Pacific people share many values, and one that we should pause to think about is the tradition of talanoa. Talanoa is a word used across the Pacific to describe a process of inclusive, participatory and transparent relationship building. The purpose is to share stories, build empathy and make wise decisions for the collective good. That's how collective security starts in our region. So in closing, Pacific priorities and people-to-people -people links, the human element, will remain at the centre of our approach. Long-term cooperation with like-minded partners is also critical. But we must also have a sense of urgency. Our near region faces a complex series of disruptors, which include climate change, transnational crime, resource competition, and geostrategic competition. And of course, pandemics, all of which impact regional security. It's by working together in this less than military other gray zone, taking a broader view of security operations that we can have the most preemptive impact in our neighbourhood. And that's where the NZDF is focusing. Look, thanks again to the RAAF for bringing us together. I look forward to seeing many of you once again uh, once our drawbridges start to come back down. And I especially look forward to celebrating with the RAAF next year as you mark that very impressive milestone anniversary of 100 years. Thank you.